America is sick and getting sicker by the moment. Is it any wonder then that healthcare costs continue to surge out of control, outpacing every other sector of the economy? Starbucks pays more for healthcare than it does for coffee beans. General Motors pays more for healthcare than it does for steel. 17 cents of every dollar spent in the U.S. goes to healthcare. That's one sixth of all spending. 48% of all federal spending is related to healthcare. Not surprisingly, as of 2018, healthcare became the biggest business in the country. And the killer, literally, is that we're not getting healthier. Why is that? Complex question. But we can boil it down to two things. One, we don't pay enough attention to our own health. Strange, our health is our greatest asset, and yet we often abuse it. We eat food that doesn't nourish, avoid basic exercise, and ignore sleep. Two, we doctors don't pay enough attention to basic patient needs. The healthcare system rewards us for doing things to people, not for people. The result? A very expensive system to treat the most obese, medicated, comorbid population in the world. Let's look at these problems a little more closely. Obesity. According to data from the National Health and Nutrition Survey, two in three adults were considered to be overweight or obese. That was in 2014. This is a serious problem in and of itself. According to a CDC study of the COVID pandemic, 78% of hospitalizations were among those overweight or obese. Overmedicated. 10 years ago, we doctors prescribed 2.4 billion drugs. Last year, it was nearly 5 billion. Did disease really double in the last 10 years? No, it's just easier to push pills than to push real solutions. Comorbidity. Let's take type 2 diabetes as our example. It's been rising at an alarming rate, especially among young people. According to the CDC, new cases are increasing at a rate of 4.8% per year. This disease can lead to harmful and expensive complications like heart attacks, kidney dialysis, and even amputations. Two groups are unhappy with how we treat these conditions, patients and doctors. Surveys show rising levels of patient dissatisfaction with the medical care they're receiving, while other surveys reveal rising rates of physician burnout. So what does the future look like? More sickness, more procedures, and more pills at an ever-increasing cost? Well, if we keep doing the same things that we've been doing that haven't worked for the last 25 years, the answer is yes. But that's the very definition of insanity. We need to take a fresh approach. It will require the combined efforts of two groups, patients and doctors. The best way not to become a patient is to be healthy. Healthy people rarely need pills or expensive surgery. Over 75% of healthcare costs go to chronic diseases. As a doctor, I can tell you the hard part about chronic disease is not telling people what to do, it's helping them do it. That takes time. It's almost impossible to do in quick 10-minute office visits where doctors have to bill for everything they do. Again, the treatment of type 2 diabetes is an excellent example. It's a chronic disease for which people either take a medication or insulin injections. Yet most people with type 2 diabetes can come off their insulin simply by changing what they eat. When a disease can be cured by a lifestyle change, medication should be the last resort, not the first. This requires a partnership between doctor and patient. Both have to make a commitment to get to the underlying cause of disease rather than simply treat symptoms. Fortunately, there's a new wave of healthcare professionals who want to make this approach a reality. We're treating diabetes with cooking classes, not just insulin. We're treating more back pain with ice and stretching and physical therapy than just surgery alone. We're treating high blood pressure with healthy foods, yoga classes, stress management, and better sleep instead of just putting people on pills. I go into all of this in much more detail in my book, The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. America has the finest healthcare system in the world. 
the most skilled doctors, the most advanced diagnostic and surgical techniques. It's there if you need it. The trick is to reduce the odds that you will need it. That's not your doctor's responsibility. That's not the government's responsibility. That's yours. We can have great health care, be healthy, and save billions of dollars. They're not mutually exclusive. It will take two groups to get it done, patients and doctors. I'm Dr. Marty McCary, Professor of Surgery and Health Policy at Johns Hopkins University for Prager University. How messed up is our healthcare system? This messed up. Researchers compared prices amongst 53 hospitals for a standard heart procedure called a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass grafting. Not only did the researchers find a tenfold difference in price for the same procedure across hospitals, from $44,000 to $448,000, but they also found no correlation between higher prices and better quality of care. Other studies have shown there can be up to a 39-fold variation in price for a simple blood test across medical centers in the same metro area. Here's the punchline. We have no idea how much we're paying for healthcare services. Why is it that when you need to get a surgery or medical test, you can't get a price the same way you can when you shop for, say, an airline ticket? Imagine if the airlines didn't post prices. Instead, when you bought your ticket, Delta just said, we'll bill you after your flight because we don't know what the cost of fuel will be that day. Then a week later, you get a bill for $4,000. You'd scream bloody murder, and rightly so. Yet this is precisely what we are dealing with in American healthcare. With rare exceptions, when you go in for a back surgery or a thousand other kinds of medical procedures, you have no idea how much it's going to cost you. Worse, no one would be able to tell you if you bothered to ask. That's because medical billing is a ridiculously complex dance between hospitals, insurance companies, and various middlemen. The hospitals charge crazy prices, $100 for aspirin, for example, and the insurance companies and middlemen agree through special, often secret deals to pay some percentage of that. That's how your knee replacement, which the hospital says costs $50,000 on its itemized bill, actually costs you $5,000 after your deductible. Out of all this confusion, one thing is crystal clear. Medical costs are skyrocketing and Americans are having more and more trouble paying the bill. Nearly one in five of us has medical debt in collections. If you think this problem doesn't apply to you because you have insurance through your employer and therefore your costs are covered, think again. Over the past five years, employees have had to increase their contribution to their premiums by 15%, in addition to a 36% increase in deductibles. Meanwhile, wage increases have not kept up, rising 14% over that same period. Yes, that salary increase you so richly deserved was eaten up by the increased insurance premium you had to pay. If the ever-increasing cost of medical care was reflected in the quality of the care you were getting, that is, if you were paying more to get better care, maybe this would make some sense. But as we saw in the coronary bypass example, there is little or no correlation between what you pay and what you get. So how do we get out of this mess? A big part of the answer is price transparency something almost every American wants. Even in our era of political polarization, almost nine out of 10 Americans say they favor price transparency for medical services. Makes sense. Markets only work when consumers have the proper information to make purchasing decisions. And the two most important pieces of information are the price and the quality of a good or service. As it relates to healthcare, Americans don't have access to either of those. Granted, there are medical situations which don't lend themselves to comparison shopping. If you're in a car accident and have to be rushed to the emergency room, you're not worried about the cost. But 60% of healthcare is shoppable, meaning it's an elective surgery, medical test, or diagnostic exam that shouldn't have much cost variation amongst providers. These services present a great opportunity to allow the laws of market competition to operate. One study estimates that $760 billion is wasted in the U.S. healthcare system every year, with administrative complexities as one of the main culprits. If a transparent upfront price was offered, and most medical care could be paid for in advance just like an airline ticket, medical centers could cut a significant portion of their administrative staff that's involved in billing and debt collection. Furthermore, if pricing was transparent, Americans could actually start pushing the market towards rewarding those who offer a fair and honest price, 
and pushing out the bad actors. That, in turn, would allow more Americans to have access to health care. We don't need the government to take over our health care. Just the opposite. We need the government to get out of the way. Let entrepreneurs innovate in the healthcare space. Whenever they do, prices go down and quality goes up. It's already happened in fields like laser eye surgery, MRI testing, and plastic surgery. Giving consumers better information always leads to better decisions, and healthcare is no exception. Price transparency not only lowers costs, but it puts the patient back in the center of what medicine is all about, helping those in a time of need. Price transparency. We all want it, so let's do it. I'm Will Brune, co-founder of Restoring Medicine for Prager University. It's very easy for a politician to stand up before voters and say, health care is a right, and then passionately advocate for single payer or free health care or Medicare for all, whatever term they might use. But before we consider the merits of the government managing your health care, and that's what this all boils down to, maybe we should ask a more basic question. What do we mean by health care? Because if you get sick, and here we're talking major illness or you're in serious pain, you don't just want health care, you want quality health care. And where is your best chance of finding that? The answer is right here in America. For skilled doctors, cutting edge medical treatments and care without long delays, no other country rivals the United States, not even close. Nobody from Texas is going to Canada for medical treatment. It's almost always the other way around. Sure, our healthcare system has lots of issues, and we should address them. But do we really want to upend all the advantages that we do have and start from scratch? Because that's what would have to happen if we completely turn healthcare over to the government. So let's imagine we make the change. We hear a lot about how great free healthcare would be, but it's only fair we look at the downside. The first is that government-run healthcare takes medical decisions away from patients, that means you, and puts them in the hands of bureaucrats. They decide, for example, how many MRI machines are going to be available, or under what conditions you can get back surgery or a bypass, or even whether you qualify for cancer treatment. That's how it works in the United Kingdom under its single-payer system. Because it has finite resources, the National Health Service, or NHS, sharply restricts access to treatments like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery, and even prescription drugs to deal with common conditions like arthritis and diabetes. If you suffer from any of these ailments and many others in the UK, you may just have to live with the pain. And let's hope you don't have a medical emergency. In a January 2018 article in the New York Times, patients in emergency rooms around London are described as having to wait 12 hours before they are tended to. Corridors are jammed with beds carrying the frail and elderly. To deal with the situation, hospitals were ordered to postpone non-urgent surgeries until the end of the month. That hardly seems like an improvement over what we have in the US. A second big problem with single-payer systems is that they are expensive, really expensive. A recent study by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University found that a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All Health system would cost a tidy $32.6 trillion over 10 years. That's on top of what the federal government spends on healthcare today. And this is not a new number. Other studies have found the cost to be roughly in the same range. So how would we pay for it? Kenneth Thorpe, a professor at Emory University and health policy official in the Clinton administration, spells it out. If you are going to go in this direction, Medicare for all, the tax increases are going to be enormous. Not just for the rich, Thorpe estimates, but for working Americans and the poor too. Charles Blahaus, the author of the Mercatus study, puts it this way. Even a doubling of all projected individual and corporate income taxes would be insufficient to finance these added federal costs. And he considers that a conservative estimate. Canada knows all about exploding healthcare costs. In Ontario, the country's biggest province, those costs took up 46% of its entire budget in 2010. By 2030, that number is projected to be 80%. In other words, in a few years, Ontario will have little money to pay for anything except health care. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, government-run systems depress the search for new cures. Biomedical research spending in the U.S. far outpaces that of any country with nationalized health care, even when you account for differences in population or size of economies. That's one reason medical breakthroughs rarely come from countries where the government controls health care. They come from the United States, where the government doesn't. 
the lion's share of biomedical research and development spending in the U.S., over $70 billion in 2012, comes from the private sector. Discovering new medical cures and technology is a profitable business, and thank goodness it is. Those profits drive innovation. Take away the profits, and you will surely take away the innovation. Single payer, free healthcare, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. I'm Lan He Chen, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. Would a government-run, Canadian-style healthcare system work in the United States, a nation of 320 million people? Well, we already know the answer. Just ask America's veterans. They've had government-run healthcare for decades. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, known as the VA, runs the largest hospital and healthcare system in America. The VA employs over 340,000 people, twice the size of the Marine Corps. And it has a $180 billion annual budget, making it the second largest department in the federal government. Only the Department of Defense budget is bigger. The VA is a true single-payer healthcare system. It runs over 150 hospitals and 1,400 community-based clinics across all 50 states. The doctors, nurses, administrators, everyone that works for the VA is a government employee. The system actively serves some 7 million patients, one-third of the 21 million veterans alive in the U.S. today. Sounds impressive, right? But for the past few decades, and especially for veterans of the war in Vietnam, as well as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan where I served, the VA has been an abysmal failure. Inefficient, bureaucratic, and sometimes deadly. Among veterans, horror stories about the VA abound. These stories were tragically brought to light in 2014, when whistleblowers in Phoenix revealed that 1,700 veterans there had waited an average of 115 days just to receive an initial appointment. According to the VA's official policy, that wait time should have been no more than 14 days. As if that wasn't bad enough, the Phoenix VA then lied about it, releasing falsified wait lists to the public to cover its tracks. Phoenix turned out to be the norm, not the exception. The VA's inspector general found systemic problems across the country. In Fort Collins, Colorado, for example, clerks were instructed to falsify records to show that doctors were seeing more patients than they actually were. In Columbia, South Carolina, delays in diagnosis and treatment directly led to the deaths of multiple patients. The VA program there had nearly 4,000 backlogged appointments, despite a $1 million grant earmarked to reduce delays. And in the VA's hospital in Pittsburgh in 2011 and 2012, there was an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease that officials knew about for more than a year before informing patients. At least six veterans died as a result. The Obama administration's own deputy chief of staff, Rob Neighbors, revealed that VA healthcare has a corrosive culture with significant and systemic failures. The politicians' response to this debacle? Spend more money, a lot more money. The VA's budget has almost doubled since 2009. They've hired 100,000 new people in the past decade. Wait times have actually gone up Yet not one administrator was fired for the waitlist scandal. The real solution to the problem is not more government, more money, and more bureaucracy. It's more competition, accountability, and transparency. Let the money follow the veteran. If veterans were given vouchers that they could use at any health care provider, private or government, they would control their own care. This, in turn, would force the VA to compete for their business, encouraging staff to treat patients as customers, not just as names on a waiting list. Until then, veterans will remain at the mercy of politicians and bureaucrats who continue to insist that the government can deliver quality and timely health care despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. The reality is that it can't. This probably best explains why two-thirds of all veterans 14 million people don't use the VA at all. And those who do use the VA still get 75% of their health care outside of the VA system, even though they have to pay more for it. 
In short, whoever can afford not to use the VA doesn't use the VA. Hardly a ringing endorsement of the system. So, could government-run Canadian-style healthcare work in the United States? Given America's experience with the government-run single-payer VA, why would we even want to try? I'm Pete Hegseth for Prager University. Why can't America's healthcare system be more like Canada's? Here's what most people who ask that question think they know about Canadian-style healthcare. One, everybody gets covered. Two, it's free. Three, it's great. Number one is true, everybody is covered. Number two is false, nothing is free. Canadians pay for their insurance through their taxes. And as you might expect, the tax rates in Canada are very high. And number three is, well, let's just say it's questionable. Let's find out how questionable. But before we do, let me tell you a bit about me. I was born and raised in Montreal, Canada. That makes me French Canadian. I'm so French Canadian, my name, Alan, is spelled A-L-A-I-N. I have also lived and worked in the United States. I've experienced both Canadian healthcare and American healthcare. Here are some of my experiences with the Canadian system, the one so many Americans aspire to. I believe they are typical. So do the Canadians I know. Experience number one. In September 2000, my wife was seven months pregnant with our youngest daughter. One day my wife started having severe lower back pain. She suspected kidney stones. She had them in the past, but she was very pregnant. So we needed to check it out. Kidney stones are bad, but something going wrong with the pregnancy would be a lot worse. We went to the emergency room of our local hospital in Montreal. This was Thursday. She was admitted to the hospital and given morphine for her pain. She couldn't get an ultrasound the next day because the machine for this procedure was fully booked. She didn't get the ultrasound during the weekend either because ultrasound operators don't work on weekends. Finally, on Monday afternoon, she got the test after I begged her doctor to do something so we could find out if indeed my wife had a kidney stone or something had gone wrong with the pregnancy. Thank God it was the former and not the latter. In the United States, a pregnant woman doesn't have to wait a day to get an ultrasound if the baby's health is in question. And ultrasound technicians are available on the weekend. Experience number two. One of my friends struggled with back issues for years. Eventually, he needed surgery. Like all people with non-life-threatening conditions in Canada, he was placed on a waiting list. The pain got so bad, after a few months, he went to see the specialist and pleaded for an operation. The specialist asked, are you suicidal? My friend responded, no, I'm not suicidal. I need a back operation. The specialist concluded, if you are not suicidal, it means you can handle the pain. Had my friend waited, his surgery would have been covered. Instead, he went to Florida and paid $20,000 out of his own pocket to have the surgery immediately. In the United States, if you're in terrible pain, you can get a back surgery within days. Experience number three. Several years ago, I was diagnosed with polyps in my colon. Since I have a family history of colon cancer, I was advised to get a colonoscopy every year. I went to see my specialist in May to set up my next procedure. After a brief consult, he told me to book the colonoscopy with his secretary on my way out. She told me that the doctor could perform the procedure in November. Being used to long waiting times, I felt that was rather short. So I said, great, that works for me. She replied, not this November, next November. In the United States, you can get a colonoscopy in a few days and certainly within a few weeks. Experience number four. Just recently, a friend had a biopsy for prostate cancer. He had to wait three months to get the results. Sadly, the test came back positive. The earliest he could have surgery was three months after receiving the diagnosis. Needless to say, cancer doesn't care about waiting lists. It grows and it spreads, sometimes beyond the point when treatment can be effective. 
I pray that my friend gets treated in time. In the United States, you don't have to wait three months to get the results of a biopsy or wait three months after that to get surgery if you need it. But here's the good news. Canadian hospice care is first rate, caring and compassionate. Once you're terminal, they take very good care of you. That's the Canadian system for you. And that's what you aspire to? I can tell you who will be really bummed out if you adopt it. Canadians. When we're in trouble, we know where to go. The USA. Don't go the Canadian route, America. Make your healthcare system better, not worse. As our great Canadian singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell says in one of her most famous songs, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. I'm Alain Lambert for Prager University. Why is the government so bad at health care? They've been at it for 75 years and still can't get it right. It's expensive, access is spotty, it's mired in bureaucracy, and it's fraught with waste. Obamacare was supposed to fix all this. But instead, like every other government health care program before it, it just made things worse. Why? Because the government is a third-party payer. Let me explain. Suppose you're going to buy something for yourself. You have two priorities, price and quality. You want the highest quality for the lowest possible price. Say you're buying a television. You have many options, the size of the screen, the quality of the image, the price. Only you know which one best suits your needs and your budget. And a lot of companies are competing for your business. You do your research, you make your choice. This is called a first-party purchase. The person paying is the person using. Now let us suppose that either the price or the quality is not controlled by you. In this case, you're buying something for someone else. You care about the price because you're paying for it, but you're a little more flexible on the quality. A good example would be a wedding gift, say a coffee maker. You might think, by the time it breaks, they'll forget who gave it to them anyway. The cheaper one will be fine. All of us have bought things for others we never would have bought for ourselves. We care about the price because we're paying for it, but not so much about the quality because we're not going to use it. Or suppose we're going to use something, but we're not going to pay for it. Then we're concerned about the quality because we're consuming it. But the cost is not as important because we're not paying for it. Any father who ever got roped into paying for an open bar at a wedding understands this program. Nobody ever orders the cheap stuff when it's free. These are called second party purchases. The person paying is not the person using. And now for the coup de gras. When it's not your money paying for something and you don't use it, then you're not concerned about either the price or the quality. Suppose the boss gives you $150 to buy a door prize for the office party. In a store window, you see a six foot tall stuffed frog marked $149. You think, oh, that's perfect, let's buy it. The raffle winner is awarded the six foot frog. Everyone laughs at the gag. Now this is called a third party purchase. A purchase that is made with money that's not yours. Therefore, you don't care about the cost. To buy something you're not going to consume Therefore, you don't care about the quality. Here's the point. By definition, all government purchases are third-party purchases. The government spends other people's money on things it won't consume. It doesn't care about the price or the quality. Thus, there will always be waste in government spending. That's why, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, government should do only those things that a man cannot do better for himself. If 300 million Americans were free to buy health insurance for themselves, just as they buy their own life and home and car insurance, then that little gecko on television would offer us health insurance with a little more coverage for a little less cost. And he wouldn't be the only one. Insurance companies and hospitals would be working night and day to get our business. Quality would go up, prices would go down. It's already happened with laser eye surgery. It used to cost $2,200 per eye. Now it can cost as low as $500 per eye. That's the way Free enterprise competition works every time. But when the government gets involved, costs go up, waste and fraud go up, essential medical services are denied or unavailable. These are the hallmarks of government healthcare bureaucracies around the globe. The sooner we make health insurance a first party purchase again, 
the sooner Americans will get the health care they want, finally. I'm Bob McEwen for Prager University. Americans carry many different forms of insurance. There's car insurance, home insurance, life insurance, even pet insurance. Most of these insurance policies work well and are fairly priced. But there is one glaring exception, health insurance. Only health insurance becomes more complicated and more expensive at the same time. So the obvious question is, why? To answer this question, we have to start at the beginning. What is insurance? It's pretty straightforward. You pay a monthly fee, which provides financial protection against unforeseen, sometimes catastrophic events. People buy homeowner's insurance, for example, to protect themselves from the financial loss incurred in the event of a fire, a flood, or theft. Because millions of people are paying into the insurance pool, the pool has enough money to cover the unlucky person whose house does burn down. And since insurance is meant to share risk, it only stands to reason that higher risk individuals have to pay more to be insured. Someone who has had two accidents is going to pay more for car insurance than someone who has never had an accident. Why? Because their track record indicates they are more likely to have another accident. But while insurance provides a bulwark against unforeseen loss, it does not protect against routine expenses. Car insurance protects you in the event that you wind up in a car wreck or your vehicle is stolen. But it doesn't cover routine maintenance like oil changes, replacing brake pads, or tire erosion. Why? Because everyone needs routine oil changes, new brake pads, and new tires. So there is no risk to protect against. Health insurance in America works very differently. Many of us have health insurance plans that aren't insurance at all. They're really prepaid healthcare plans. They cover routine checkups, less serious illnesses, and recurring expenses like prescription medications, in addition to protecting you from a health disaster. All of this has made healthcare much more expensive and complex than any other form of insurance. That is true whether you get your insurance through your employer, through the government, or if you pay for your own plan. The Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, was passed on the promise that it would fix these issues and bring down health care costs. But it has actually made the problem much worse. First, it limited the variety of health insurance plans private companies could offer. It did this by mandating that every plan had to cover the same set of 10 health benefits, including preventive care, maternity care, mental health care, and contraception. Second, Obamacare prevented insurers from charging premiums based on the risk they were assuming. A person with a much higher risk of getting sick couldn't be charged more than a person with a much lower chance. These two aspects of Obamacare, requiring all policies to have certain coverages and not allowing insurance companies to charge more for riskier clients, caused the price of insurance to rise dramatically. In Arizona, for example, the price more than doubled between 2016 and 2017 alone. So, how do we undo this mess? By making health insurance more like, well, insurance. First, stop making people buy plans that include things they won't use and don't want. Second, allow health insurers to offer more options at different prices. Do these two things, and you'd make health insurance a lot more affordable for a lot more people. And what about people with pre-existing conditions for whom every insurance plan is just too expensive? We do what any compassionate society does. We make sure they get the medical care they need. But we don't need to upset the whole concept of insurance and make healthcare more expensive for everyone else to do it. Most Americans want to do the responsible thing and insure themselves against catastrophic healthcare emergencies. But with health insurance costs rising every year, being responsible is becoming more difficult. I'm Lon He Chen, Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution for Prager University. Here's a riddle. How is it that ever since the government began telling us what to eat, we've gotten fatter and sicker? In 1977, when the government first set dietary guidelines, the average American male weighed 170 pounds. He now weighs 197. It's not any better for women, 145 to 170. And you don't need an academic study to know the same thing is happening to kids. Just look around. The weight gain has real-life consequences. The percentage of Americans diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, a condition that can lead to severe medical issues, 
has risen from 2% in 1977 to over 9% in 2015. In hard numbers, that's 5 million people to over 30 million people. How did this happen? It all started innocently enough in the 1950s when President Dwight Eisenhower had a heart attack while in office. Suddenly, the issue of heart health became a national obsession. Keep in mind, this was an era when scientists had harnessed the power of the atom, unlocked the secrets of DNA, and cured once incurable diseases like polio. Surely, there had to be a scientific solution to heart disease. There was, and a charismatic, medical researcher from the University of Minnesota named Ansel Keys had it. Cholesterol, Keys claimed, was the villain of the heart disease story. His now famous seven countries study determined conclusively, in his mind at least, that people who consumed high amounts of fat, specifically saturated fat, had higher cholesterol levels and thus higher rates of heart attacks. Lower your fat intake and you would lower your heart disease risk. The ever-confident Keys spread the gospel. As an influential member of the American Heart Association, he was in a very strong position to do so. There was only one problem. Keyes' study was bad science. The sample size was so small, the data collection integrity so shoddy, and the lifestyle variables between the countries he studied so great that his research had no scientific validity. In other words, he asserted a conclusion he couldn't prove. When other scientists questioned Keyes' conclusions, they were invariably met with stern responses like, people are dying while you're quibbling over data points, and there are great benefits and no risks to adopting this new way of eating. In 1973, the American Heart Association set the dietary limit on saturated fat at 10%, and in 1977, the U.S. government followed suit. Where did the 10% value come from? It didn't come from any scientific data. It was merely a government committee's best guess. This was despite contrary evidence like the 1957 Western Electric Company employee study showing no difference in heart attacks in those who ate more or less saturated fat. A longer term study of the same Western Electric subjects in 1981 reached the same conclusion. But again, no one wanted to hear it. To make this all easier to understand and to spread the message to schools, the food pyramid was created. That's the chart you first saw in third or fourth grade, with all the supposedly good foods at the bottom, meaning eat a lot of those, and the bad foods at the top, eat those ones sparingly. What our kids are fed in school, what our military troops are fed on bases, what sick people are fed in hospitals, what crops we plant, and how we raise our cattle are all predicated on this deceptive nutritional concept. As Americans ate less saturated fat, margarine instead of butter, processed oils like corn oil instead of olive oil, low-fat milk, low-fat yogurt, and so on, they also started to eat more heart-healthy grains, exactly what the food pyramid and the updated version called MyPlate advise you to do. As the consumption of saturated fat decreased by almost 40%, the consumption of refined grains, carbohydrates that convert to sugar in the body, increased substantially. Total intake of calories also began to increase. This happened in no small part because food companies took advantage of the low-fat craze. They lowered fat and increased sugar. Suddenly, supermarkets were full of supposedly healthy, low-fat, high-sugar foods. It remains that way today. Foods that are high in sugar stimulate reward centers in the brain and leave us wanting more. Thus, the famous line about potato chips, bet you can't eat just one. The end result is a fatter population with greater and greater health issues, like type 2 diabetes, a problem that's getting worse, not better. How do we get ourselves out of this spiral? There are many answers. For some, it's a low-carb, high-fat diet. For others, it's a Mediterranean diet. For some, it's vegetarianism. For others, it might be something else. You need to find the best solution for you. And that's really the point. We need to take responsibility for our own health. If the food pyramid has taught us one thing, it's this. Don't rely on the government to take care of you. I'm Dr. Brett Schur, cardiologist for Prager University. Healthcare costs are skyrocketing. 
Since the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, health care costs have gone up by double digits each year. The health care bill did get more people insured and helped with issues like pre-existing conditions. But the problem with the health care law isn't what it tried to do. It's what it failed to do. Reduce costs. The solution to the cost problem is with the free market and competition. Here are just three ideas that could make a huge difference. Number one, we can roll back the tax burden on insurance companies. The ACA added a $60 billion tax on health insurers, which made them have to charge more to consumers to cover their costs. Taxes roll downhill, so a tax on insurers means higher costs for all of us. Number two, we can lower the regulations on health plans. The ACA has a lot of requirements that force insurance plans to cover an incredibly big list of benefits. If you want a bare-bones insurance plan that simply covers catastrophic events like a car accident or cancer, you currently can't get one. By boosting the benefits of every plan, it restricts competition and drives up prices by forcing smaller health insurers out of the marketplace. Low-cost catastrophic plans that are normally purchased by younger, healthier people are no longer available because of the ACA requirements. Introducing as many health insurers to the marketplace as possible can drive down prices by encouraging businesses to compete to cut costs. The ACA did the exact opposite, less competition and higher prices. Number three, encourage medical innovation. The cost to bring a new drug to market already exceeds two and a half billion dollars, and the ACA places an additional $22 billion tax burden on innovator drug companies, the same businesses that produce life-saving medications and cures for those in need. Punishing drug producers forces them to charge even higher prices to make up for the lost money in research, development, and taxes. If we encourage, not punish drug makers, it will lead to more breakthroughs and lower costs, a win-win for all of us. As healthcare costs skyrocket, don't forget that the free market is our best chance to rein them in. Imagine there's an organization that claims to stand for one thing, but actually stands for another. Imagine this organization calls itself a healthcare provider, but it's not involved in preserving life, it's involved in ending it. And imagine that you help finance this organization, whether you want to or not. Well, you don't have to imagine. This organization exists, and it has a name with which you are very familiar. It calls itself Planned Parenthood, and the deception begins right there. Planned Parenthood doesn't help people plan for parenthood. It helps people escape it, and that's only the start of its deceptions. Planned Parenthood tells you it's one of the nation's leading women's health care providers, but it provides very little health care. It tells you it provides adoption referrals, but the only adoption advice it is likely to offer is Google it. Most deceptive of all, Planned Parenthood tells you that abortions are a small part of what it does, but it performs more abortions than anyone else in America. Here are the facts. The folks who run Planned Parenthood boast that they provide life-saving cancer screenings. And they do. Just not that many of them, less than 2% of the nation's screenings each year. They talk about providing breast exams. They do, but just not that many of them. Again, less than 2% of the nation's total. They talk about providing ultrasounds, but the last thing they want to do is show a pregnant woman an image of her growing child. So they don't. The ultrasound is only for Planned Parenthood's use to better facilitate patients' abortions. In other words, abortion, not women's health, is Planned Parenthood's reason for being. Every year, it does more than a third of all abortions in America, over 321,000 of them. That's equivalent to every inhabitant of St. Louis or Pittsburgh wiped out every year. That's over 880 abortions every day, and abortion every 98 seconds. And while the number of total abortions in the United States is going down, Planned Parenthood's market share of abortions has increased from 23% in 2006 to 34% in 2016. So when Planned Parenthood says it's devoted to women's reproductive rights, what it means is it's devoted to aborting as many babies as possible. And here's the biggest deception of them all. Planned Parenthood would like you to believe that abortion is only 3% of the total services they provide. 3% doesn't sound like very much, 
does it. But here's how they get to that 3%. They count every discrete clinical interaction as its own service. What is a discrete clinical interaction? Pretty much anything you do from the moment you walk into one of their clinics. I'll give you an example. Let's say a woman comes into Planned Parenthood for one service, an abortion. Before providing an abortion, Planned Parenthood has to confirm that the woman is pregnant, right? So they administer another service, a pregnancy test. That's two services. Then, after the abortion, on your way out the door, they hand you a prescription. That's three services. And there are many other services provided during the abortion process that Planned Parenthood claims as discrete clinical interactions. In this way, Planned Parenthood is able to rack up 9.5 million of these so-called services each year. Divide the number of abortions, 321,000, by 9.5 million, and you get 3%. Even the Washington Post, a Planned Parenthood ally, declared this 3% figure very misleading. Rich Lowry of National Review nicely illustrated this phony statistic. It would be like Major League Baseball saying they sell 20 million hot dogs but only play 2,430 games, so baseball is only 0.012% of what they do. So why does Planned Parenthood engage in all these deceptions? Well, as they say, follow the money. According to federal law, the United States government is not permitted to spend taxpayer money on abortions. But Planned Parenthood receives over $500 million a year in federal funding. Not for abortions, mind you, but for those other discrete clinical interactions. Over the last 10 years, its annual clientele has dropped 23%, almost a quarter. But during this time, its taxpayer funding has skyrocketed from $336 million in 2006 to $543 million in 2016. The reality is, just about everything about Planned Parenthood is a deception. Its purpose, its funding, its very name. That's why Planned Parenthood's biggest enemy isn't conservatives or religious people. Its biggest enemy is truth. I'm Lila Rose, founder and president of Live Action for Prager University. Have you ever waited in line for hours at the state-run DMV? Or wanted to pull your hair out at the government-operated post office? Well, if some governors and members of Congress have it their way, government red tape and lackluster customer service would also extend to health care. Government-run health care has recently been repackaged as Medicare for All and is a big move away from free market competition. As a result, the quality of service will likely drop and taxes will skyrocket. Many medical professionals have also indicated they won't participate in a government-run healthcare system, so you may not be able to keep your existing doctor. In practice, this could mean waiting hours for much-needed medical care or up to a year for surgery, a major problem for time-sensitive procedures. The price tag of Medicare for All is also jaw-dropping. Instituting the program is estimated to cost over $3 trillion per year. That's more than the U.S. government spent on military, health care, social security, and other entitlement benefits combined in 2015. Inevitably, that additional financial burden would fall onto the American taxpayer, slowing economic growth and stifling business expansion. Medicare for All may sound good in a campaign stump speech, but putting the idea into practice is risky and comes down to one question. How do we pay for it? What are association health plans? Healthcare is a big issue for families and businesses. Healthcare costs have skyrocketed for the past decade and some of the biggest price increases have been for small businesses, which don't have the buying power to spread the risk across many employees like large corporations. They often have few choices for insurance and have to pay a lot more to cover their employees. One way to fix this problem is by expanding something called association health plans, which allow small businesses to band together to negotiate better prices. The Department of Labor has proposed a new rule that would expand association health plans to allow small business to participate in them. Many of the burdensome regulations and costs that are passed on by insurance companies to employers would not apply to association health plans. This would allow association health plans to operate across state lines, which will result in more choice and lower prices. Small businesses would be on a more equal playing field with their big business competitors. 
If association health plans are expanded, as the Labor Department has proposed, health care costs for tens of millions of small businesses and their employees would fall dramatically, finally bringing some relief to one of the biggest victims of rising health care costs. What's up, guys? This is Will Witt with PragerU. Today, we're at Pacific Beach here in San Diego talking to people about health care and if it should be free. Let's do it. What do you guys think about health care in America right now? I think it's can I cuss in here? <laughs> Man, it's a mess. It's a mess. Definitely important. You gotta have health care. You gotta have some health care, you feel me? Yeah. You don't have health care, you don't care about yourself. I think that it needs to be better. I think it's <laughs> stupid um, because they charge you way too much. It's all about money. Um, I think holistic health care is a lot more um, of, like smarter. Yeah. It's just a basic human right to have health care, you know what I'm saying? Like everyone should be entitled to live a happy and healthy life. It's like in our yeah. Bill of Rights or whatever. Like, what uh, what would you do to fix it if you had the power to? Let's say, <sighs> if I had the power to, oh man, universal health care is only the beginning. What comes after that? Oh man, I'm really on the spot right now. I'm gonna opt out of this actually. Uh, See ya. Really? Oh, okay. Okay. I guess we're leaving. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Like universal free health care. Do you think that that's like a good idea? Um, me personally, uh, no. Um, I don't necessarily know if like free is the right answer, but I definitely think it should be more accessible to everyone. I think everyone should have health care. It's important. For free? I mean, for free. You know what's pay for it? I think it would detrimentally uh, impact society as a whole if we covered every single person with, you know, with full coverage. Yeah. Is it really free though? But I'm saying, it's I know the taxpayers, the we're going to have to pay for that. Exactly. All in our tax. I get that. Part, Are you willing you know to do that? Like, I can yeah. see where it would be free, but then, like, other people take advantage of it. So it should just be cheaper than what it is right now, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But not free. Yeah. I think everybody should have free health care. America's a business. That's facts, though. You got to work for your stuff. That's facts. That's you true. don't work. You don't eat on a game. <laughs> if I make, I'm not assuming, I'm just using hypothetical. If I make a lot more money than you, do you think I have a right to better health care than you? Not at all. No. no. The people who work to get their stuff is going to get seen quicker. That's a good point. That's, That's what it's supposed point. to it's be. It's a great point. I if got somebody, you. I shouldn't be getting the same health care as a homeless person. I'm going to keep it G if I'm working for my money. I got you. And he's just chilling there and he breaks his arm. And if I break my arm, I think I should get it quicker. Because we see in some countries like in the UK, Canada, where they have health care ran by the government, everyone there who needs like expensive medical coverage comes to America because our healthcare is just a lot better and you also get seen a lot quicker. So it's like the free healthcare systems around the world actually have worse service and it's more expensive. People aren't coming to, people aren't going from America to Canada to get their healthcare coverage. It's always the other way around. Yeah. not American. Where are you from? Ireland. Ireland. How was the healthcare in Ireland? Uh, it was good, either. but it's not great now. A lot of the nurses are striking because yeah. they're like overworked. Public health care is in like a bad way at the moment, and like private privatized health care is on the rise. I think Americans, a lot of Americans, pride themselves in working hard to support them and their families, and so um, it's part of the a big. I mean, obviously, a big discussion. That's why we're sitting here right now. Yeah. All right, guys. So we just finished up here at Pacific Beach, and it was a very mixed reaction for people. Some people wanted free health care, some people didn't. And we were able to educate a lot of people. If you want to be educated and you're a student and also get involved with a ton of great people all over the world, text the word Prager Force to six four six zero zero. That's Prager Force to six four six zero zero to join our student ambassador program. It's a fantastic program. Meet people all over the world, get digital marketing experience, and meet great people like me and Dennis Prager. That's it, guys, for today. Thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, share this video with your friends. See you in the next one. Peace. Any final thoughts? No. I feel famous. <laughs> you feel famous? Yes. We're very famous here at PragerU. What's up, guys? This is Will Wee with PragerU, and let's go over why Medicare for All won't work. First of all, it destroys innovation within the free market. If the government is the only provider of medical insurance, that means that the government are the ones setting the prices. That means that the only price that you're going to get is from the government. Have you ever been to the DMV? You know how these people work? They don't care about you. They're bureaucrats who work for the government. You think that they're going to care much about the prices of your health insurance or care much about the quality? When you have health care that is run by the government, a bunch of bureaucrats, they are not going to spend your money wisely because they're not spending their own money. They're spending your money. So they don't care so much about how it's used. With all these different benefits that the government made you have in your Obamacare plan, it made costs skyrocket. You saw in Arizona that prices for health insurance actually doubled in a one-year period. But what about my country of Sweden with my free health care? 
Doesn't work, okay? The only reason why these countries are able to do that is off the backbone of America. America far, far outpaces any country on amount of medical innovation spending. So with the medical innovation that comes in the free market of America, these other countries are then able to reap the benefits with their free healthcare system. If America were to adopt a Medicare for all system where we were no longer having medical innovation in the free market, you would see all these other countries' healthcare systems collapse because they're no longer getting the innovation that America produces. And let's say Medicare for all actually worked in America and everyone got a good plan and waiting rooms weren't so long like they are in the UK like they are in Canada with their Medicare for All programs, you still have just huge prices for this Medicare for All system. All these leftists and socialists say that you can just raise taxes on the rich, on the 1% on Wall Street. Well, what's gonna happen when these rich people don't wanna pay taxes for other people anymore? They're gonna leave, and then who's gonna foot the bill? That's gonna be middle-class Americans having to pay exorbitant costs for healthcare and poor people who then have to pay huge premiums for their own healthcare from the government. Even if taxes, were doubled on every single American, every single American's taxes were doubled, you still wouldn't be able to afford a Medicare for All system in America. So let's go over this. Medicare for All destroys competition in the free market. It destroys medical innovation. And thirdly, it is too cost expensive to ever have in America. So when you hear leftists talk about Medicare for All or free healthcare for all, remind them that that is an anti-American idea and that we should be looking for freedom against government control. I'm Will Witt, thanks for watching. What's up guys, this is Will Witt from PragerU. Gavin Newsom just said that he wants to give free health care to all illegal immigrants in California. We're here in Manhattan Beach and we're gonna talk to people and see what they think about it. Do you think that illegal immigrants should get free universal health care in America? I think everyone should have free universal health care, everyone in the world. Illegal immigrants getting free health care? No. Why do you say no? They should work for it. Do you think that uh, illegal aliens should have free universal health care? Yes. Yes. I believe universal health care is a right that every person should have. Do you think that illegal aliens should get free universal health care here? Illegal aliens should get free universal health care? I think everybody should get free universal health care. If we were to put it in place, who, who would pay for it? If you're paying taxes, it would probably go towards that as well and they're paying taxes. Do you think it's fair if, if illegal immigrants, they don't pay taxes into the system, um, but we do, that our money should go towards paying for their health care, even though theirs doesn't go towards paying for ours? Most definitely. Do you think that illegal aliens pay the same taxes that we as natural citizens pay? Right do now? I think they do right now? Yeah. Illegal aliens aren't paying into the tax system. Yeah, so we shouldn't have to pay for them, right? Kudos to them, though, if they can do it under the table. It's impressive. Who would pay for that? I don't see a problem with everyone getting higher income and having more taxes. Who do you think would pay for the universal health care if we had it here? Government? Probably the taxpayers. It have to be the taxpayers. I mean, you guys got to give some to take some, right? What's up guys, this is Will Witt with PragerU. Today we're at the annual 420 Festival here celebrating weed, the legalization of weed in Denver, Colorado. We're talking to people today about socialism and free healthcare. Let's do it. So why are you guys here today? To so just celebrate f***ing 420, dude. Yeah, fair enough. yeah. What do you guys think about free healthcare? I think it should be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want that? I don't know. Yeah, who wouldn't want that? Yeah. Who do you guys think would pay for the free healthcare? I couldn't tell you, I don't know enough about politics, unfortunately. <laughs> you guys think we should have free health care? Yes, most definitely, because some people aren't able to afford it, so, I mean, it'll be beneficial mostly to them, but to people also in America. We should definitely f have it. Right. Like, yeah. we should definitely f have it. It's a necessity nowadays, so. I'm a, I'm a combat veteran, so, like, uh, my health care is taken care of by the VA. I believe, though, that we all are entitled to health care. Other countries are doing it, and it's working, so wake up, join the 21st, uh, 21st century. Yeah. yeah. A question, when you see like the VA and how they handle healthcare, they don't do a great job with it. Um, you think it would be better with like the free market handling that or with like the government trying to handle that? I don't actually know. That's a good question because the government does make a, a complete cluster of the VA. You know, I've been trying to get an appointment for seven months, so. And I'm an author. You're an author? Yeah, I, I wrote the ebook Revolution or Extinction. What do you guys think about socialism? Um, I mean, I think it's really like a good thing to like, you know, have and like do, you know, socialize with like a lot of people and like meet a lot of people, you know, so I don't know. I think it's like a good thing in life to like 
introduce yourself to people and like it's talk. Good. We're so we're socializing right now. Oh yeah, yeah, right. You don't like my haircut? It has a lot of potential. Dude, your shit is boring like a Republican. <laughs> you young, my. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's true. A Republican I haircut. Right. That's but true. I don't want to look like a Republican, like a Bernie Sanders wants socialism, Ocasio Cortez, some other people. What do you guys think about that? Is it a good idea, socialism in America? I think so. Yeah, I think it's just stigmatized based from like from history. But if we incorporate incorporate some aspects of it and still keep you know a democracy, because. Um, it's like a form of our economy. So if we merge the two, I think it could work. You need to stop looking at like Russia and all those countries and look to the future. What do you think about socialism in, in Colorado and America? I think we have to have socialism now. Having democratic socialism makes sense. It's really about helping people in our society. If we have money for war, why wouldn't we have money to help our citizens? How do you guys feel about the direction Denver is heading in? Uh, I don't know. I'm just like, you know, whatever happens, happens. Bringing your kids to a 420 festival. Nice. <laughs> what do you think about socialism? Good idea? I don't know if it'd be a good idea for us, but let's try it. All right, guys. <coughs> We just finished up here at the 420 Festival here in Denver and we found that everyone we talked to wanted socialism and free health care. The education system is not doing a very good job here in Denver. This is my home state and it's very sad to see that. So thank you guys for watching. We appreciate it. Stay cool, man. Like this video, share with your friends and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.